This recording is part four in a series of recordings over the lymphatic system. Um, so what we're going to do with this uh, recording is talk about innate immunity, which is nonspecific immunity. Now when we talk about immune defenses, we can break them down into first, second, and third line of defense. The third line of defense is actually your specific immunity. The first and second is innate immunity. So we're going to look at various things that are part of the nonspecific or innate immune system. So the first thing we have is we have mechanical barriers, physical barriers. They are part of our first line of defense. And now they include your skin, which you see a picture here, and mucous membranes. Now the um, think about the skin as long as it's intact, it's actually a barrier to keep pathogens from coming in. But if, say, you cut it, the, the pathogens can actually infiltrate into the skin. skin. So they, they prevent approach and deny access to pathogens. Now, we do have some chemical barriers. And the chemical barriers are part of that kind of second line of defense. They're usually associated with that first line of defense because they're... Um, things that are secreted by um, the mucous membranes or with the skin. So what we have is we have some enzymes that are part of gastric juice and tears. And in your stomach, in the gastric juice, we have an enzyme called pepsin, which breaks down proteins. So if you swallow potential pathogen, pepsin can help destroy it. And also associated with tears is we have an enzyme called lysozyme, which is actually antibacterial. Now we do is associated with the stomach. We also have acid, gastric acid, which is causes the pH to be very low. And that prevents growth of bacteria, helps to destroy that bacteria. So I'm going to write prevents growth of bacteria. And if you think about with sweat, your skin, and also your tears, there's, it's salty. So high concentration of salt has osmotic effects, which kills off some bacteria. So just think about it. So here's, here's a, for example, bacterial cell. And if you have a lot of salt out here, what happens is the water leaves that bacterial cell and can cause that cell to die as a result of the effects of osmosis. So we have mechanical barriers, we've got chemical barriers, um, but we also have, um, it's part of the, pretty much everything from now is part of that second line of defense, is we do have phagocytes. These are cells that um, are specialized that engulf and ingest foreign particles in order to destroy them. Now, the, when they engulf them, the, what they engulf fuses with the lysosomes that are part of the cell, and it helps to kill them by using those lysosomal enzymes. Um, they also uh, destroy cells by releasing things like hydrogen peroxide and uh, nitric oxide. So there's other things that the phagocytes do to help kill off particles. Now we do have um, different types of phagocytes. We have ones that they actually refer to as microphage versus macrophage. Micro is small, macro is big. Now the microphage include neutrophils and includes um, eosinophils. So here is a neutrophil which is our most abundant white blood cell that we have in circulating in your blood. And we also have eosinophils. And eosinophils, I think that this picture is trying to do it, but it has all those, those kind of dark red to orangey granules in there. And so we have eosinophils, too, that are considered microphage. Those are both phagocytic cells. But we also have um, monocytes. So here's a monocyte, but it will, monocytes give rise to macrophage. So in tissues, they 
um, the monocytes will develop into macrophage that will engulf things. Now we do have what we call fixed or free macrophage. I'm going to give you some special names for some of the macrophage. And some of them you've heard of before, some of them you will hear about again, is we have these cells called Kupfer cells. Now Kupfer cells are macrophage specifically located within the liver. They are found lining the sinusoidal capillaries that we have within the liver. Now we do also have what you see here is microglia, which are glial cells that are found in the brain. So they're there to engulf any pathogens and also pick up any cellular debris. Um, the same goes with any macrophage, they can pick up cellular debris too. Now we also have what you see here, this is a slide of the skin in which you've seen staining all in here are Langerhans cells. They're very similar to macrophage, but they're actually a type of dendritic cell. So they call them dendritic cells because they had mistaken um, dendritic cells for being part of the nervous system, but they're actually dendritic cells or antigen presenting cells. So Langerhans cells um, are phagocytic, but they're also going to present antigens to other components of our immune system to kind of bring in some more defenses to try to prevent any type of infection from occurring. Now we also have part of our um, innate immune system is immunological surveillance. And these are cells that I've talked about previously. Natural killer cells are lymphocytes. So lymphocytes include T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. Natural killer cells being the only lymphocyte that's part of the innate immune system. They will kind of circulate around, and if they encounter things that are potentially don't look right, they look abnormal. So you see it's like, oh, and here's like, he's got the little list. Okay, you don't look right, you're gonna kill it. And it could be your own cells if they're infected. So the natural killer cell will destroy abnormal cells by releasing something called perforins. And it kind of sounds what it does, it perforates the cell membrane and the cell will lyse as a result of it. Now that is not the only cell that releases perforins, but is one of the cells. And this is how the natural killer cell will kill abnormal cells. And again, does is not gonna be specific, is, is if it's abnormal, it will kill it, doesn't discern between different types of pathogens. So here, this is actually what I just wrote, just showing you how it kills it. So here's the perforin molecules and they actually create pores in the cell which kind of make that cell membrane not a barrier anymore so the cell lyses in, uh, in response to it. Now we also have defense proteins that circulate in the, in the, in the blood and interferons is, are one of them. So it kind of sounds like it interferes with something. So interferons are um, going to kill uh, things. They're actually, I should say, they are antiviral. They're specific for um, viruses, and they can be released by activated macrophage or lymphocytes or any cell that's virally infected. So it's gonna try to prevent spread of the viral infection, but it also increases other cells from being infected, so it increases resistance to cells to be infected. Now, interferons is actually one of the things that are in those cocktails that are given to people with HIV infections um, to help to um, pro prohibit um, spread of the viral infection or proliferation of the viruses. Now, interferons also stimulate phagocytosis, and what you're gonna notice a lot, there's that, a lot of interlap, or, or interlap, I don't think it's a proper word, but overlap or um, where some components of the innate immune system influence other components of the innate immune system plus components of your specific immune system will employ components of your innate and vice versa. Now the um, interferons also enhance the activity of those natural killer cells, which are natural born killers, and our macrophage, which again are phagocytes. 
So we have interferons. Another defense protein that we have are, is complement. Now complement will, um, is a, um, or I should say plasma proteins that actually circulate in an, in an inactive state that become attached or fixed to foreign cells and are activated and become a major factor in the fight against foreign cells. And actually the fixation or, or activation of complement is kind of similar to our blood cascade system. It's an actual example of positive feedback regulation. And it's very complicated, but you don't have to worry about the whole cascade mechanism on how which complement becomes activated, but to know what complement does. So activation of complement um, results in increasing inflammation, which is one of the things that we'll talk about that is part of the innate immune system. It increases phagocytosis, which I'd mentioned is again another component of our innate immune system, and it also promotes lysis of cells. So it's going to destroy bacteria and by promoting cell lysis. Now, it does this by a number of different means. Okay, so let's kind of look at some of the stuff that it, it does. Is um, Here is a um, phagocytic cell or leukocyte. And the, the cell that it's trying to engulf is actually opsonized. So what is opsin opsonation? Um, opsin is, comes from a Greek word. And what it does is that the complement will, will coat the potential pathogen and it opsonizes, it makes it more, I should say, appetizing for phagocytes to eat it. So opsonization is um, which the, these complexes are made more susceptible to phagocytosis. Another thing it will do, oh, I just have to show you this picture, is I always, I love the minions. So I would, my analogy is, is you're going to, the minions were going to be the phagocytes, is you coat something in bananas, because minions love bananas. For me, you coat something in bacon, I love bacon. Um, here it's showing you um, another thing that um, the complement does, is it promotes cell lysis by forming, if you kind of look really carefully at this pathogen right here, and it says, um, you know, it's like my perfume, why it's activated complement proteins. Do you like it? What actually you see formed in there is a membrane attack complex or MHC. So it forms this membrane attack complex, which is kind of equivalent to forming pores into that membrane. So MHC. Another thing that complement does besides the opsonization, so we mentioned the opsonization, is it allows chemotaxis. So chemotaxis attracts phagocytes into the various regions. So chemical, releases chemicals that are going to cause more white blood cells to come into that area, more phagocytes to come into the regions that are uh, infected. It will also, I had mentioned, it stimulates inflammation and it does this by enhancing the release of histamine. So histamine is released by these cells called mast cells. And histamine does increase permeability of vessels. And that's gonna be something when we talk about with inflammation, we're gonna see what that does. Um, histamine is also a vasodilator, which will increase blood flow to that area. So complement, again, also the MHC, helps to form a membrane attack complex, which promotes the lysis of the cells. Now, the inflammation is kind of, I was leading to inflammation. Inflammation is a very important component of innate immunity. And you see this person's toes are definitely exhibiting some signs of inflammation. And there's some characteristic responses or things associated with inflammation. And you see the Latin words for these uh, terms or things that are associated with inflammation. You always associate inflammation with being red. So rubor is red, calor is heat, then calorie. Tumor is swelling. 
and dolor is pain. So what we need to do is we got to figure out what are these characteristics, what is so beneficial about having these characteristics. And we do want inflammation. You just don't want too much, but inflammation is actually a good thing. Um, one of the things, so we got to ask, what are some of the, the mechanisms by which leads to inflammation and then why do we want it? Is one of the things that we'll have is we have that heat and the redness, and that's actually because of increased blood flow. So you have increased blood flow, and the reason why you have increased blood flow is because the release of histamine. So histamine is released by damaged cells and this in mast cells are, that are associated with that tissue. And histamine is a vasodilator, so blood vessels dilate, which increases blood flow. So the, in, the effect of blood vessels dilating is you have increased flow, blood flow, which leads to heat and the redness. Well, heat, one of the things we're going to look at, look at is the effects of heat on is part of the innate immune system, but the heat actually helps to promote um, uh, to kill off potential pathogens, but also promote um, repair. The redness is you get the redness because of because the increased blood flow. But why do we have increased blood flow? We need to bring in more white blood cells. We need to bring in things that help with repair of the tissue. Um, so you want to have that increased blood flow. Now, histamine also promotes increased permeability. So perme capillary permeability increases, and the effect is you get swelling. Now, the increased permeability is um, needed to bring in uh, clotting factors. Say if you've cut yourself, uh, brings in complement proteins, because remember, activation of complement is also important in, in nonspecific immunity. Um, you the complement will also help break down cell walls of bacteria and also attract more um, phagocytes to the area. And that swelling is going to help to isolate, um, kind of act as like a natural splint. It's going to isolate things in the area and prevent spread of uh, pathogens. Um, you have uh, the, the release of chemicals by damaged tissues, which attracts the white blood cells and to the, that site of injury and refer to it again as chemotaxis. And also damage to the tissue releases factors that, that trigger pain. Now pain is, it, it's needed that we're aware that something is going wrong so we could, um, you know, clean up the area, seek a seek medical attention. So having something that's painful is actually a good thing so we can get some attention to it. You also, with the release of certain chemical factors, you can have a systemic response which can result in fever. And fever is one of the last things that we're going to look at for um, nonspecific immunity. So we'll wait, we'll wait to look at what fever does. But the, um, the or see, tenderness and pain are kind of together. We'll put those together. But what we're doing as a result of inflammation is be able to bring in what we need to fight off the infection, bring in things out to repair and make us aware that something's wrong. Now, we do have a, um, a system of checks and balances in place where cortisol is anti-inflammatory. So at the same time as inflammation is going on, we actually are going to release um, more corticotropin releasing hormone by that hypothalamus, which targets that anterior pituitary, which then releases ACTH, which then stimulates that adrenal cortex producing cortisol. And what cortisol does is it's, it's anti-inflammatory. It's going to try to keep inflammation from getting too out of hand. 
Now, obviously, sometimes it does, and that's why some people go see the doctor, and you will take glucocorticoids to help to suppress inflammation. But naturally, you have inflammation. Cortisol's there to try to keep inflammation in check. So glucocorticoids suppress the inflammatory response a number of different ways. So it pretty much suppresses all aspects of inflammation. So it inhibits the mast cells from releasing histamine. So you see all the histamine coming here, and that histamine was increasing that permeability of the capillary. It was causing vasodilation. It inhibits the movement of neutrophils into that area and inhibits the activity of the neutrophils, which are pathogens, or not pathogens, phagocytosis. So here's potential um, pathogens that have gotten through a wound. Um, it also uh, inhibits the activity of macrophage. So macrophage, um, again, inhibits the phagocytic activity of macrophage and inhibits the release of cytokines, which would retract more um, cells to that area. Now, this is needed because if inflammation is too out of hand, you do have collateral damage. It will affect normal cells too. So we don't want to have too much inflammation. And this is why some people take, um, have steroid creams or they go and get a, um, a prescription for some glucocorticoids to suppress um, inflammation if it gets too out of hand. Now while I'm here, I actually want to mention a couple things is in the inflammatory response, the actually first cells that are attracted to an area is our neutrophils. They're the first to come. And actually the second are monocytes. And the monocytes are second. And macrophages are just tissue monocytes. So monocytes are the second. Um, eosinophils may actually get involved too, but primarily you'll see uh, neutrophils and monocytes come to an area. Now the last thing I want to look at for innate immune system is fever. And actually, I'm going to come back here real quick to this picture when we're talking about inflammation and you talk about the heat, because this is all tied in, is an increase in temperature of that tissue actually increases enzymatic reactions and it also accelerates phagocytic activity and it denatures foreign proteins. So that's kind of think of that as along the lines when we have a fever in which we have increased temperature throughout the body. So fever is a, helps us to do a number of different things. It, as I mentioned before, that increase in temperature does accelerate phagocytic activity. Um, it helps to accelerate repair. It's going to denature foreign proteins. Another thing that it does is an increase in body temperature will affect your blood iron levels. So what it does is it causes your liver and your spleen to sequester iron from the blood. So why would we want that? Well, iron promotes phagos, um, I should say, iron is needed for growth and proliferation of bacteria. So we kind of want to hide that from the bacteria. Plus, having that lower levels of iron in the blood increases the activity of our phagocytes. So it's important, this is one thing that you need to be aware of, is people who are on iron supplements, that if they're running, if they have a fever, they're kind of counteracting the effects of the fever because the fever is trying to sequester in the iron, and if you're taking iron, it actually promotes the growth of bacteria. But um, that temperature, the increased body temperature is actually a good thing. Fever, if it gets too high, obviously you need to bring it down. I think brain damage occurs if it's the temperature is over 107.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But, um, and I don't know the cutoffs. You can always look up the cutoffs for children versus adults. But a lot of people are just jump on the gun. It's like, I'm going to take something to get my fever down. Your fever is your body's natural way of killing things off. Let it do its job. If it gets too high, yes, you need to bring that temperature down. So if you look at this picture, here's germs on Motrin. They like it. 
So take some Motrin. They're going, it's going to take you longer to get better. But germs on a fever, mm, they don't like it. So what the um, Motrin does and other anti, I should say antipyretics, pyretic is something that causes a fever. So antipyretic, think of pyromaniac, they like to start fires. An antipyretic like Motrin, what they do is they are cyclooxygenase inhibitors and they inhibit um, the production of one of the prostaglandins, PGE2, and things like aspirin or Motrin do that. And so um, they actually will um, bring a fever down because PGE2 can reset that thermostat in the hypothalamus to cause your body temperature to go up. So it's going to try um, those uh, Motrin and aspirin, it's going to bring fevers down. So you really let, need to let the fever do its job because if you take something to bring that fever down, it actually um, makes it longer for you to fight off that infection. But again, if it's too high, yes, you need to bring it down and go to see a doctor. Now this is the last part of our innate immune system. So actually what I want to do is let's just, um, just list them really quick. So you have mechanical and chemical barriers. Got your first line of defense here, chemical or first and second line of defense. And then we have all our second line of defense. You've got, and not necessarily any particular order, you have your phagocytes, you have defense proteins like interferons and complement, interferons, complement, you have your natural killer cells which are part of immunological surveillance. You have, um, let's see, inflammation. And you have fever. So these are all part of the innate immune system. You were, you were born with this, no prior exposure to any antigens for this and they are nonspecific. So the next recording is gonna cover specific immunity.